Thanks for listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. Don't forget to listen live on accesswdun.com and join my Substack at Martha Zoller with free and paid subscriber content exclusive to you. Follow me on X at Martha Zoller and join me every day. with Steve Moore. Um, We're going to talk about the jobs report, but first I wanted to ask him about a new report that uh, Unleashed Prosperity is doing related to um, uh, the issues on oil production. And Steve, you hear the administration say they're producing more oil than has ever been produced before. You hear them talk about this while at the same time, you know, wanting to suppress it. What is the truth of the matter? Well, we're, we should be producing about two or three million more barrels a day, a day. So that's a lot of oil. And if we just stuck with the Trump drill baby drill strategy, we wouldn't be reliant on OPEC. We wouldn't be reliant on, on Iran. I don't think that if Trump had been reelected and stuck with our pro-American energy policy, I don't think that um, Putin would have had the money to, to roll his tanks into, F- I mean, into uh, Ukraine in the first place. So um this is bad for our national security it's bad for jobs it's bad for our trade deficit it's bad for our budget deficit there's no rational reason why we wouldn't want to be producing as much oil gas and clean coal as we possibly can we're we have um 600 years worth of coal we have 300 years worth of natural gas and we have 250 years with worth of oil with existing technologies we're not running out of the stuff and people say, well, oh, but we got to worry about climate change. Even if you're if, if you're worried about climate change, it's not something that keeps me up at night. The, the United States not producing oil doesn't change anything. All it does is just instead of getting the oil from Texas and Oklahoma, we're getting the oil from Iran and Russia and Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. So it's a very flawed strategy. And I guarantee you, if Trump wins, he, the first thing he's going to do is is turn the spigots back on again. So what is the, I mean, what are the biggest challenges we face regarding energy? Because you mentioned climate change for just a minute. And, you know, I've been listening to a lot of immigration coverage uh, on countries around the world. And all of the kind of left-wing European countries and even our country, if you listen to the administration, says one of the reasons all these immigrants are coming is because of climate change. But I have never, I haven't seen an interview with one person crossing the border that says they're coming because of global warming. They say they're coming for a better life. They say they're coming because they can. They say a million reasons. But I've never seen one say I'm coming to get away from the climate. No, and actually, you know, it's really interesting you should mention that because, uh, you know, Hispanics and uh, and black voters don't care about climate change. That's not near the top of their list. They care about jobs. <laughs> they care about their family. They care about fighting crime. They care, care about having an income so they can, you know, take a vacation, you know, this summer with their kids. And so you've got these rich elites, Democrats, are saying, oh, we have to do all this stuff on climate change. And... You know, I know this because the polls show it. Black and Hispanic voters don't care about that issue. It's like they don't care about LGBTQ issues. They care about their families. And I, it's just an example. If I sound frustrated, the Democrats have become so out of touch with Main Street America. It, it's it's unbelievable that they think that if you ask the average person on the Yale faculty or on the Yale campus, what's the biggest problem in the world? They'd say climate change. If you ask somebody who's working for a living... You know, uh, if you ask somebody who's an electrician or you ask someone who's a nurse or you ask someone who's an accountant, what's the biggest problem? They say, paying my bills. (laughs) That's the biggest problem. So this weekend in Las Vegas, President Trump said that he wanted to end the tax on tips for service workers, which I I, I say hooray because that was the dumbest thing I ever saw in the world when they started trying to figure out how much tips people got and how to tax it. It's terrible. It's like... It's it's just a mess. But good, what good do you think Trump. It's a smart smart policy? It's a smart policy and what do you think, you know, if if you had a crystal ball, what are the first three things that a Trump administration needs to do on the economy? Well, Trump has said, you know, the first thing he's going to do is is get back to producing as much oil and gas and coal as we possibly can. I mean, it's a freebie. It's like we're sitting under this treasure chest. Uh 
as to why wouldn't Martha, why wouldn't we want to use it? You know, why wouldn't we want to use those resources? What the United States of America is a well, you know, God endowed our country with incredible resources and we should definitely use them. And when some as I said, we're not running out of them. Uh, and that by the way applies to minerals as well. We should be mining for copper, for uranium, lithium. Why do we have to get all these uh minerals from China? We have more minerals than they do. Uh, and so that would be number one. Number two would be to, you know, make sure that the tax cuts that we did in 2017 that were such a big success don't expire. Uh, and then the third thing that Trump has talked about many times is that, you know, he's going to have a stack of papers on his desk on, what is it, January 22nd, 2025, to repeal a lot of these orders that, uh, that Biden has put in place that really hurt the economy. Yeah, I think there's so much work to be done. Um, And again, I always said, I'm not so worried about the domestic policy, even though I don't like it, because we can fix it. My biggest problem with Joe Biden from the beginning was that he has been wrong on every national security issue since 1975, and he Uh has continued that being wrong, okay? He doesn't know how to manage. He looks weak. That makes it worse for us economically. It makes it worse for us from a security standpoint. It makes this worse for us because, as Condoleezza Rice said, and I'm sure she wasn't the first one to say it, but when the American, when American government, when American leadership is weak, it creates a vacuum that gets filled by something that we're not going to like. And I am very worried about that. So I just, uh, last week I was, uh, at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley because it was the, uh, 20 year anniversary of the death of Ronald Reagan, one of our five greatest presidents, in my opinion. And, um, have you been there, by the way, Martha? Uh, yes, long time ago, but it's a great yeah. place. It sure is. You know, I, it was probably my fourth or fifth time being there. And every time I go, I get, I just feel so inspired, you know, by great leadership. And, you know, he was a great, great, great leader. And, and, you know, I was thinking of him when you were just talking about this. I mean, you know, Reagan basically won the Cold War without firing a shot, right? He just built up our military, built up our economy. We became so strong that no country wanted to mess with us, you know. And, uh, you know, weakness is provocative and strength is a good deterrent. And so we're not strong today. You know, I hate to say that about our country. We're not strong today. Look what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, people should... To look, look at the feeble response that's happening. You know, the, nobody is afraid of us anymore because we have a president who is weak. And, you know, that's why we need to change because it's a dangerous world out there, folks. It's a dangerous world out here. Steve Moore, tell folks how they can get your newsletter. Committee to Unleash Prosperity dot com. Get it. It's free. It costs nothing. Just go and uh, get it um, and just go uh, sign up for it at Committee to Unleash Prosperity dot com. We'll start sending it to you five mornings a week uh, right to your email. And um, you can, you know, you can be the smartest person in the room if you start the reading The Capitalist that. News. I love that. There you go. <laughs> okay. Steve Moore, thanks for being with me today. Thanks, Martha. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. We want to finish up with Wyatt and Buford, and then we're going to be talking to Congressman uh, Buddy Carter. Wyatt, I took a look, and it appears that there were about six people altogether that were char- were charged and convicted with this particular, it's called a blockade of a of an abortion clinic. Uh, they all got 24 months. The one person got uh, four years, and she was not. She was praying as a part of it, but it's called a blockade. She was blocking entrance. She was part of a group blocking entrance. I kind of think this was overkill as far as the sentences, considering their ages. What do you think? Well, one thing I want to say is during the Roche, right, Richard Brooks thing in Atlanta. Yep. You know the girl. That set the Wendy's on fire now. Yeah, she, she got nothing. On, she set it on fire. Yes. And the fire went out, and she reset the fire again, burnt the building down. She got five years probation. That's it. Yeah. And a $500 fine. Yeah, it does well, seem, and why? thanks for your call today, it does seem that if it's on the conservative side, they get the book thrown at them. And if it's on the liberal side, just what we saw Saturday in Washington, D.C., defacing monuments in Lafayette Square, and basically nobody got arrested. 
So uh, Congressman Buddy Carter's here with me today. And, Buddy, I know that's not what you called about today, but it is frustrating to me. And we're getting a lot of response from people about just the, you know, the unfairness of how things are being pursued right now in this country. Well, there's no question about it. This administration has weaponized the Department of Justice and the FBI, and, and they're using it for their own purposes. And, yes, you're right. There are certain crimes that they are, are, are prosecuting, but there are others that they are just turning their head and not looking at it all. And that, that, that's not America. That's a third world country. That's why we've got to get this back under control. That's why we've got to get a change in the White House. That's why we've got to get Donald Trump back in the office so that we will be a law-abiding country like our forefathers set us up to be. Now, I want to talk a minute about the borders because we had this EO executive order that went into place last week, but it doesn't seem to be really anything. It seems to be just something so he can say he did something. I know you've been to the border. I know it's something you're concerned about. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, all this is is a, a political ploy. I mean, let's face it. This president is underwater. He understands that he's, he's behind the polls. I mean, look, they can, they may be able to rig the jury box, but they're not going to be able to rig the ballot box this time. We're going in this with eyes open, and we're not going to let that happen. So this is the administration's just grabbing for straws here. And But it's too little too late. I mean, instead of having a wall, this president has put out a sign that says open for business. And people are flocking in. Nine and a half million illegal immigrants have been confronted at the border. A hundred or 1.8 million known getaways. We don't know how many unknown getaways. This is costing the American public over $150 billion a year. Every taxpayer, almost $1,200 a year are having to pay because of illegal immigrants. And this is not acceptable. And this is one of the two things that people are upset about the most in my district and throughout the country, and that is the border and that is the economy. Both of those are on top of people's minds. Well, and the worst part about it is that you say it costs $1,200, but it's $1,200 we don't have. It's $1,200 that we're printing as opposed to actually being able to balance a budget. Now, Congress is going to be getting back into session. Tell us what the week looks like. Well, we're I'm in the airport right now, headed back to Washington. Hopefully this week we're going to get the NDAA done. Now, the NDAA is the National Defense Authorization Act. For 63 straight years we passed this, and I think we're going to be able to get it done this week as, all, as well. Now, the NDAA is used for a lot of amendments. In fact, uh, I saw a number this morning that said that there had been 1,357 amendments offered. I will tell you that about six of those are mine, and, and I've offered some amendments to it as well. That's to be expected. Uh, the Defense Committee understands that, that, that the NDA is going to have a lot of amendments added to it. They're okay with that as long as they're not controversial. And that's where we, we really do try to get a lot of work done in the NDAA. Hopefully we'll get that done this week. We're scheduled, if everything goes well, to vote on it on Friday. And I think that we will be able to get that done. Well, the problem I see is that we're still functioning from a total budget standpoint as if COVID was still happening. Um, that, you know, we've seen no reduction in spending uh, compared to the COVID spending that was added in. You know, Rand Paul, who I don't like a lot of his ideas, but his idea of going back to the 2019 budget, which was a trillion dollar deficit, by the way, uh, but going back to the 2019 budget, adjusting it for inflation, which would be about $5.3, $5.4 trillion. And that would be about as close to balancing a budget as we've been since the late 1990s. And it's still a significant increase in spending related to uh, spending without COVID in there. So why can't we get something reasonable like that through, one, and two, President Trump is finally talking about the budget. You know, in his first term, he really didn't. Do you think he's going to work harder on that if he's reelected? I hope he does. And I do think he will, because I think Congress is going to be putting pressure on him to do that. I know that we in the budget committee, I serve on the budget committee. And and listen, Martha, right now, the second highest line item 
in our budget is the interest on our debt, not paying down our debt, just paying the interest on our debt. Social Security is number one. The interest on our debt is number two. Medicaid, Medicare is number three, and defense is number four. We cannot sustain that. That is unsustainable for this country to have $34.5 trillion in debt. Paying the interest on that debt alone is, is just going to break us. That's why we've got to get this under control. We need to get to where we can pay off some of this debt. One of the things that, that I have suggested is a zero-based budget, and that is where we go and we start, maybe not in just one year, maybe we do it over a two-year period during the session, but we look at each department and start at zero and then go and, and figure out what that department needs instead of just saying, okay, last year you had um, $500 billion. This year you're going to get $510 billion. Instead of doing that, let's start from zero and well, say you know, what that, needs to – what. I, I think were you part of that movement in the state house when you were there or in the state legislature where they took a department a year – so that every seven years you had a complete look at the budget. I would be happy if they just did a department a year from top to bottom. You know, it would get it on a cycle, you know, where you actually are looking at what's being spent instead of just saying, hey, you get an increase. Well, that's exactly right. And that's what we're suggesting to do. You know, so many of these departments have not been reauthorized. Some of them have never been reauthorized. And, that, and that's one thing in the Energy and Commerce Committee that I serve on, just like the FDA and, and just like the departments that we have jurisdiction over. They've never been reauthorized. They need to be reauthorized. We need to look at them, and we need to look and see, are they truly achieving what they were set up to achieve? Are they, do they need to be reauthorized? Do we need them anymore? There are instances where there are some departments out there that – have outlived their purpose. Well, that's true. And also, when you look at the part of the budget that's on autom- automatic pilot, a huge chunk of that is Medicare. And I got my Medicare card yesterday, buddy. I'm going to be turning 65 in August, okay? <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm in the, I'm going to be in the system here pretty soon. But here's the thing. It's, it's a lie to say we don't spend plenty of money on health care. We spend probably half of the budget. I haven't totaled it up, but I bet half of the budget is spent on some kind of health care, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, stuff related to ACA, whatever it is. And but we're not getting the best value for our money. You know, we're not no because to your point, we don't look at it from year to year. I bet there's things we pay for in Medicare that are obsolete and there are new treatments that we can't get paid for, that people aren't getting. We have got to have some oversight on this. There's no question about that. And that, by the way, is the fastest growing segment of our budget, Medicaid and Medicare. And we've got an aging population. We know that. And that is the fastest growing segment of our budget right now. That's even more reason why we need to get it in control. Well, buddy, I would love to have you one of these days come in here. I know it's a long way from the first district, but we now have a new studio on the square in Gainesville. And it's the, been the, we've been celebrating the 75th anniversary of our company. But I would love to have you come in for an extended discussion to talk about these issues because I believe we can solve them. I am not a negative person. I believe that if we get on the right track, we can actually solve some of these problems. I couldn't agree with you more. If we set our mind to it, I I believe the American people can do anything. And think how much and think what good we could do with that money that we're spending on the interest on debt. Think of all the good things we could do with that money. Yeah, unfortunately, we we wait until our backs are up against the wall instead of actually working on it when we can. Buddy Carter, we appreciate you being with us. You're always available, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It is the Martha Zoller Show, and joining me right now is Representative Rich McCormick. He's really one of my favorite people. I love his history of service. I love the way he became a doctor and the work that he's done, the fact he served his country, he's worked in an emergency room, and he understands how 
medical systems at the real level of delivery work. So I just love talking with him. But we're going to talk to him about a couple of things today. Uh, first, Representative McCormick, I got to hear about your trip to Normandy. How are you? I'm good, thanks. It's uh, always good to walk away from a jump. Uh, <laughs> all, of, uh, all of the congressmen who jumped in uh, survived without any injuries. Uh, it was actually uh, surprising. I thought that somebody would get hurt. We had uh, one of the Band of Brothers cast that jumped a couple days before us, uh, broke his ankle. A couple other people broke their legs. I was watching them. Uh, when, when you land, you're supposed to drift forward into the wind. Uh, if you run with the wind, it was about probably about 15 miles per hour, and you have about a, a forward airspeed of about 11. So you could land at about 26 miles per hour. That's like getting body slammed or jumping off a moving car. And some of these people uh, broke their legs, uh, not us, though. And uh, we had one guy strip his uh, bicep because he got the cord wrapped around his arm, which is one of the more common injuries for jumping also. But but we uh, kept the majority and, and uh, happy to walk away from a, a great, great tribute to these World War II veterans that are uh, at the youngest, 96 years old now. So they're almost all gone, guys. Uh, appreciate them while you can. They're, they're true heroes. Uh, nothing like what we've done. Uh, I'm not trying to make small of anything we did in Afghanistan or Iraq or anything else, but these World War II veterans saw some stuff we'll never even comprehend. Well, Alan Kinder, who lives in our community, uh, is 98 years, 99 years old. He'll turn 100 in uh, January, and I saw him this morning. I went by to see him. He lives across the hall from my father-in-law at Smoky Springs in Gainesville. And he, I went by to see him this morning, and he was so cute because he's from Washington State originally. And he said, you know, honey, I don't agree with your politics, but you did the best interview of me that anybody did. <laughs> ah, that's great. But we can talk about it. And I said, that's the whole point. We've got to talk about it. So tell me about some of the other things you did while you were there. Well, we got to uh, tour uh, all over the Normandy area uh, it's actually amazing how many patriots there are. You saw as many American flags as you saw French flags. You saw people driving around in American Jeeps dressed like American soldiers, like extreme replicas. I mean, they look, you wouldn't be able to tell them from the World War II guys. It was funny. They couldn't speak a lick of English. Uh, they they yeah. literally just French fans. Well, you know, they it's, love the Americans there. So we're going to France in the first week of September for the liberation of southern France. Uh, we've got my father was in that uh, movement. He passed away a long time ago, but I'm taking my husband and my my children and and the whole family because he and three other guys right after the Battle of Montreal were, were captured. And so they spent the next nine months in a prison camp in Germany, but then escaped and were able to connect back up before the end of the war. But um, it, it's, it's like that with them, all the guys that are organizing this, and they organize this parade and this reenactment every year. They've done it every year except for COVID since, since uh, 1944. And it, they love, they love Americans. They know more about my dad, not than I do, but they kept up with all the men that were part of this monument they have in their square. They love Americans, Rich. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a special generation. Those people really have never lost their love for that, uh, for that service that we did for them. Uh, I had uh, my great uncle, George, flew B 17s. He's actually part of that, that Master of the Air. Uh, that they're doing on on uh, Apple TV, which is a phenomenal series, by the way. Uh, the Black Thursday, where they shot down, I think uh, I can't remember twenty one. Uh, now more than that, uh, they lost like massive amounts of B-17s in one day, just being shot down from all over. Uh, these guys, if they survived twenty five missions, just twenty five missions, they got sent home because it was considered a rarity. Uh, it was expected that you were not going to make it through through right. that many missions. Absolutely, these guys were exceptional. So thank you for going. It is, you know, that's on my bucket list, too, to go to Normandy. But I just felt it was so important that my family and I go for this celebration, the end of this summer, uh, because my dad was there. And, you know, he used to talk about it being the best years of his life. And mm. and I until I started working with veterans after 9-11, even though I was always respectful, Rich, until I actually got my hands dirty working with veterans and traveling around and helping raise money and doing all of that, I didn't understand what he meant. But I do now, and I'm thankful for that. 
I'm thankful for all those guys who went before us. And like we have some good guys, young guys now coming out. We just had our academy day. Actually, we're going to have an academy day to, uh, tomorrow in, in district. Uh, the young people that are going to go through the academies and just watching uh, their patriotism and their verve, uh, I, I hope we're in good hands going forward. So were you at the event yesterday that President Trump uh, came to in D.C.? I was. Uh, it was exciting. He brings a lot of energy. Uh, it was it was fun to watch uh, just this, this movement. Sometimes I get a little cynical. I, I admit I'll watch people waving flags and, and uh, trying to get people to honk on the street corner. I'm like, okay, but are we doing anything? What are we doing to change America in the future? And some of it is. I mean, it's just getting people to come to the church, people that are already uh, belong to the church to get out and vote, right? So it's kind of like the fire under brimstone. That's what some people are really good at is getting people out that, that already belong, that haven't been to church for a while. Uh, but I think we also need to, to, to work on the, the converts, so to speak, and that's a whole different conversation. One is the red meat that gets people excited enough to show up to the polls. The other one is having the conversation uh, with folks that, that don't always agree with us, and that's not – that's got to be a respectful conversation of – uh, of not just emotion and trying to convince somebody they're wrong because you're never going to get on the internet and, and think that, oh gosh, somebody's going to say, oh, thank you for proving I'm an idiot. That's not how it works. But if you can get somebody to, to believe that you love them, that you want what's best for them, what, what's best for this country, you can talk about almost anything. And we're on the right side of history right now. And I think President Trump is onto something where if, if nothing else, if you can get people to realize What's what's not working is what Biden is doing. What's not working is what the Democrats want to do when they when they want men and, and women's sports, when they want to tax and spend us into oblivion, when they want our debt to be paid by generations to the point where it's impossible and, and that we're starting to lose our the petrodollar, the 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 uh, the United States is the currency standard of the world is about to go away and that will affect our economy forever. And there's some things to consider that, that only we as Republicans are fighting on the right side of history right now. Well, and I'm encouraged because, you know, you supported somebody different initially. I supported somebody different initially in the primary. And what I was encouraged about is that in the last couple of weeks, you've seen President Trump actually start talking about spending and debt and, and that part of it, because he, that wasn't really a part of his discussion in his last two elections. He started to do that. And then he made some very magnanimous statements about larry hogan yesterday because larry hogan while he's he's maybe not my brand of republican he is the republican nominee in maryland and that's a seat that we can potentially flip and win back control of the senate so you're seeing that uh side of donald trump the deal maker side of donald trump the side of donald trump that people like and i hope we see a lot more of that I think he can be there, and, and I'm, I'm watching even even how he's talking about Ukraine and stuff like that. Ukraine is a divisive topic in the Republican Party, and we and I can respect both sides of the argument on this. And and you know whether you're a Reaganite or or you're a uh, isolationist, you know there's 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 things to be said about either one of that. Um, but I think if you if I listen to what Trump said the other day, I thought it was very he, he's very much trying to find that common thread and, and trying to talk about you know peace through strength. I think we all agree on that. So the things that we can agree on moving forward are what we should focus on, because otherwise uh, a lot of times we bring bills before, I think, gosh, you know, they don't have a chance of passing. They divide us and they unite their Democrats. There are certain things that we know unite us and divide them, that we're on the winning side of history and we are going to win popular support. And it's the things that matter most in this country right now. And I, I call it the elementary items, you know, A through E, A being the American dream, which means smaller government, and uh, and more freedoms. That's what Reagan focused on all the time. B is border. Uh, we all want a stronger border. I mean, it's like a 70 to 80 percent issue now. The border is something we should be always focused on. Uh, C is crime. Uh, nobody thinks it's okay to walk into a store and walk out with stuff that you're going to have to pay for ultimately with your your price of the the item because you're making up for for basically organized crime that's being legitimized by Democrats. D is debt. Uh, it's going to ruin our economy. It's going to ruin the uh, uh, the, the currency standard that we have worldwide, um, that's something we're on the right side of history on. E is energy. Cheap, affordable energy is what dro drove the entire economy of the United States for the last 200 years. It's why we've dominated worldwide. And as we lose that, we once again are jeopardizing our entire economy, our, kind of, uh, our entire living standard. And then education. Education choice is what won Yunkin his uh, governorship, what won DeSantis the first uh, time around in, in Florida. If we focus on those elementary issues, A through E, 
We are on the right side of history. It unites us, divides the Democrats, and we will dominate. So one final question. You had a really fantastic exchange back and forth with Dr. Fauci a week or so ago where you, as a as a practicing physician who was in the emergency room at the time of the beginnings of COVID, um, it you know you really brought something to it that I don't think he 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 had had happen before, and that he couldn't answer for. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know the whole thing that that disrupt disrupted the the treatment is that the government tried to run the show when it came to treatment. Now they, these are people who had never treated a patient, and Fauci included. There are several people who are quote-unquote medical professionals, but they had not laid their hands on a disease process that they had ever seen before, and and yet they would criticize or even censor people like myself who are actually on the front lines treating patients since the beginning of the pandemic, watching the evolution of evidence and treatments and how it's actually playing out, and they would censor you and threaten your license and threaten you, limit your ability to have your business open, limit your ability to travel, limit your educational opportunities, all in the idea that they were the scientific experts. And almost always they proved to be wrong. And yet they had no apology, no qualms with the, the government overreach and power. And, and that's what I want to expose. Whether Fauci goes to jail or not, which is doubtful, just watching how this plays out, um, I want us to realize that we should never ever give up our freedoms to the government we should never allow the government to use any excuse to take our guns to take our freedom of speech to to take our freedoms to to exist our 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 god-given rights to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness which is exactly what happens when you use fear to count out the american public into giving up their liberties well i mean and honestly that this idea that, and my husband, as you know, is a primary care physician, and and that you can't try things that might work in a situation like a pandemic that we've never seen before, when you've got the opportunity to do so, that should be encouraged in a scientific model, not discouraged. That's right. And what's funny is everything they try to censor me on, everything they did censor me on, everything they threatened me over, I ended up being right. Now, I might have been wrong. But in this case, I, I was right. And, and once again, censored by people who did not treat patients and, and who would literally make your life miserable. That's why I love paying, playing that, that recording of him basically saying, we're going to make your life horrible unless you get a vaccination. We're, you're not going to be able to travel. You're not going to be able to go to school. You're not going to have uh, the ability to hire or fire anybody or have your business open. Unless you do what the government says, your life is going to be miserable. And that's exactly, he said, oh, that was taken out of context. Bull crap. That's exactly what you meant. So, Rich McCormick, if people need to get in contact with you, what should they do? RichMcCormick.us is uh, my website for the campaign. Of course, you just Google me nowadays. It's, it's pretty easy. <laughs> uh, we've got all kinds of contact out there. And, uh, uh, you know, our hearings uh, with Fauci, you put Rich McCormick and Fauci, you can see what we did. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to get a hold of our office. We're always here to help. Top 10 in constituency services, top 10 in uh, legislation passed. I got a great staff working for me. We're proud to serve you guys, and we're going to keep on fighting the good fight. Well, I look forward to having you come into our new studio. We'd love to do an extended interview with you. Thank you for being here today. Always a pleasure, Martha. You have a blessed day. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com, and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.